Hello, I'm Ridi Kavi. You are listening to the third episode of COP28 All Access, coming to you live from the UN Climate Change Conference in Dubai, known as COP28. This is a special four-part series with Investec Focus Radio SA. We are really on the ground, bringing you negotiations, insights and debates and the events as they unfold here at COP28. We are more than halfway there, and part of the events this past weekend were dedicated to amplifying the voice of the youth. We've seen how renowned climate justice activists like Greta Thunberg and Vanessa Nakate have taken the challenge of the climate crisis right to the echelons of power all over the world. They've protested and urged world leaders to do more to respond to the calamity that threatens our planet. Here at COP28, it is no different. Youth leaders from all over the world have addressed plenaries and participated in debates and panel discussions. Those who've not had the opportunity to be inside the venue have used the occasion to make several demands. More youth inclusion, respect for indigenous communities, placing child rights at the heart of the climate response. In fact, at the youth dialogue held here a short while ago, they urged world leaders not to gamble with their futures. Very strong and robust challenge coming from the youth. As expected, most of the protest has centered on the main issue that is regarded as the root cause of carbon emissions and global warming, fossil fuels. They want them phased out urgently, saying, we dream of a future with clean water, a future where food security is a reality and we get to go to school without worrying about floods or high heats. A UN climate conference really would not be complete without youth protest action. They are loud and they are everywhere. I stumbled upon this protest on my way to a plenary. And we're here with a coalition to kick big polluters out. And we come here because we understand that if the fossil fuel industry is leading the negotiations in this space, that we'll come up with solutions that aren't going to mitigate climate change. If you look at all the regions where there are fossil fuels in Africa, the host communities are suffering from the impacts of their projects. So I'm here to demand that our leaders put an end to the fossil fuel era and to transition the world uh, towards renewable energy. It is disappointing that the COP28 is being held in UAE given their heavy dependence on fossil fuels and them pushing for fossil fuels. Uh, COP has been captured by fossil fuel corporations and now uh, fossil fuel producing countries. That's why we're seeing a lot of greenwashing around the phase out and a hesitation to clearly put text that phases out all fossil fuels. The importance of that relationship is to protect her and that's why we are a target. But more than that, we are determined. We are determined and strong. So their message is loud and clear. Despite these strong protest events and action, COP28 Youth Climate Champion, Her Excellency Shama Al-Mazrui, received the protest in good faith and she's pleased with the presence of young people at the conference. I caught up with her as she received the Global Youth Statement. This is the most inclusive youth COP ever, whether it's youth from indigenous communities, LDCs, SIDS, uh, youth with disabilities, um, uh, youth from displaced and conflict areas, etc. But also, it's a big turnaround in terms of affordability, accessibility to COP, support for logistics, expanding the platforms to connect with decision makers and share their policy proposals. And I want to talk about some of the events today as well. But also turnaround for capacity building of young people, free educational resources for youth to be prepared to enter the COP negotiations on a level playing field, ready to contribute meaningfully and effectively. And we sought especially to elevate these the issues that youth have highlighted that have never been adequately addressed in COP, hosting the first presidency events addressing the impact of climate change on young people's mental health, the challenges of youth leading climate action in conflicted uh, and affected areas. Now, before I tell you about today's um, uh, Youth and Skills Day, I want to stress that the COP28 presidency made sure to integrate youth across the whole two weeks of COP and all thematic days had a youth component to truly mainstream youth inclusion. All right, thank you for tuning into this podcast to ensure that you don't miss the final episode of COP28 All Access and to listen to previous episodes, please follow Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's continue the conversation. So, 
I'm actually quite excited about this. One of the most formidable voices of COP28 is that of 13-year-old Eliane Wanjiku Chilston from Kenya. She's known as the Tree Girl of Africa, following in the footsteps of the legendary Wangari Matai, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2004. The 2004 Nobel Peace Prize went to Wangari Matai, a Kenyan, for her contribution to sustainable development, democracy and peace. So, Eliane is 13 and she's already planted over 1 million trees. In fact, 1.3 million trees to be exact. She takes a leaf out of the late Matai's book, who founded the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. This trailblazing teenager has built a community and social movement. She has addressed world leaders, including King Charles, right here at COP28 and is starring in a film with David Beckham. She's only 13, folks. I caught up with her while she was being a child, swimming at the hotel pool and eating an ice cream to cool off from the Dubai heat. Eliane, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, You know, everywhere I turn at COP28, people are saying, have you met that girl? Have you met that girl? Have you met that girl? How how is your impression? What are your impressions of the conference so far? Did you expect it to be the way that it has been? Yeah, so, you know, this is my first COP, so I haven't really, you know, experienced much and seen much before. And, like, you know, so, like, seeing if there's any, like, point of improvements because my first uh, my first COP. But, you know, so far, like, what I've seen so far is really amazing. The fact that we have, like, a lot of people there, not just from, like, one specific area. It's mainly, like, a lot of people from indigenous tribes, a lot of people from the Pacific Islands, from Caribbean, from Africa, from Middle East. A lot of them are from Middle East because of Dubai. And, you know, a lot of these things, you like, they really make me happy to see that people actually want to make a difference and not just some people, but everyone almost. And, you know, to see that people, you know, actually have contributions to make, especially children. Like there are a lot of young kids here at COP and, you know, they have different passions and different, you know, experiences, different backgrounds. And, you know, to see them contributing like me is really amazing and to see them actually wanting to make a difference for their generation and for their future is really amazing. So, yeah, other than that, I think COP is just going amazing. I've had a great time meeting all these lovely people and, um, you know, meeting all these, some of the VIPs and stuff like that is really amazing. And finding and that's you what know, I wanted to ask you. I mean, you just said yeah. now that this is your first COP28. It's your first COP28 and you get to meet King Charles. What did that feel like and what was your message? So when I met King Charles, you know, he was a really amazing man. Aside from all the allegations and everything, he has a really good soul in him. And, you know, he's a very generous man and he actually wants to make a change in the world for the kids who go through malaria for the kids who are suffering from climate change and you know there was point of partnership in the future that we talked about and point of meeting in Kenya as I wasn't able to meet him in Kenya because I went to film with David Beckham about malaria so yeah wow David Beckham I mean you just roll off these names like I bet you they are more privileged to meet you uh, you know but let's talk about your passions and your activism you know I was once 13 years old and I would never have done half of the things that you've achieved at your age. I watched a video of you and you were described as Africa's tree girl and you'd planted about 1.3 million trees at that time. I mean, my mind can't just perceive of such a wonderful, wonderful contribution to our planet from somebody who is as young as you. You still have to go through school. You still have to do the things that you have to do. What got you started? When did you just wake up in the morning and thought, this is what I want to do? So this is a question I get almost every interview because people are really inspired by the, what I do and my work. So it all started when I was four years old in kindergarten. When we were doing a project about heroes, and these heroes included Martin Luther King, Henry Anyoike, who Kenyatta, Wangari Maathai, um, and many of the heroes. So I really fell in love with what Wangari Maathai was doing. So I started planting trees because Wangari Maathai was a, a tree planter. She got abused because she was protecting, you know, Kuro Forest. And she still managed to, her forest is thriving, but not as much as it used to before. And, you know, she planted over 30 million trees in her community with women and it was really inspiring. And um, she got a Nobel Peace Prize. So she really inspired me and her message and everything. And, you know, the hummingbird story, make a difference, even if it's very small. So, yeah, I started planting trees just like her. And I was four years old at that time. That's when I got my passion. And I told my mom, I want to start planting trees. And she's like, no, you're not going to plant trees. Uh, when Grandma Thai really, she got a, abuse and, you know, hit and everything. And my mom didn't want me to get hit and everything. But, um, you know, I said, I persisted. And I said, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. 
and boom, here I am today. Um, from the persistence that I had, instead of giving up and just living a normal life or living a typical teenage life, I guess you can say, and doing nothing except doing my sports and academics, I'm here today trying to make a difference for my generation. Instead mm. of starting late, I started very young. I started very early, which really has made a difference. And, you know, okay. nothing happened to the coincidence. God made it a purpose because you don't just find out every four-year-old coming to their mom and saying, I want to start planting trees. Like, it's like, I feel like I'm a, 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 this 1% of kids who actually do that. And yeah, I'm, I'm part of that 1%. You don't find the kids coming home and saying, I want to make a difference in the world. Or you don't find the 13 year old all the time. I mean, you do find them these days, but not all the time. Finding them talk at, at COPS and, you know, finding them talk to world leaders about the health issues and the world issues that are happening and climate change. So, yeah, but it also just started because I really wanted to make a difference and I wanted to be like that in tree girl of Africa, basically. So, yeah. You mentioned Wanga River Chai. I mean, she, she also inspired me. I've interviewed her before, may her soul rest in peace, for a radio interview a, a long time ago. And that's the amazing thing, Elian, that you you wake up and you think you are doing something for your community, but the world the work travels across uh, countries. It travels across borders. And here I am now talking to you. I'm a South African, you're a Kenyan, you're going global. Did you think that planting trees, just that act alone, would turn out as big as it has turned out? Uh, were you prepared for how big it became? No. You know, in some ways I was, in some ways I wasn't. You know, in some ways I was like, oh, maybe when I get to the age of um, 10, because, you know, 10 was like a big year for me when I was younger. I was like, maybe when I get to the age of 10, I'd be like, oh, let me just give up and let me just, you know, stay on my phone and stuff like that, blah, 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 just yeah. do my academics and everything. But, you know, it just, it kind of like just happened like that. I mean, there do there are days where in my head, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I just want to live a normal life. Just, you know, be able to do like normal things, see my friends whenever I want to. And, you know, not have to travel so much and miss out on like, mm -hmm. you know, physical education. Because right now I'm doing homeschooling, you know, not having to miss out and just being able to go to school any day I want to. And, you know, being able to go to school seven days a week and do normal kid things. But, you know. As much as I really appreciate all the success, I, I do wish, like, even, like, right now, I just really want, I I love this meeting, and I really appreciate this meeting, but I just came from swimming, and I wanted to swim, like, almost the whole day, but a one hour or something has been taken away from my schedule, but it's fine, because, you know, I always realize that this is all for a change, and this is all for a difference, and, you know, as much as I'm a human, and money is really good and everything, and this might get me a profit, and this, what the, the stuff I do, you know, I don't really do it for the money, I do it for the change that I want to see, like, I don't want to be going to cop in 30 years to come and hearing the same exact words I would use in the cup I just come to my first cup mm -hmm. and you know it'd be really disappointing if that happened so yeah. I just think when cup ends on the 12th of December 2023 there needs to have been a, a, a small actions taken like this this won't cost much like people have donated like 777 million to end NTDs and to end malaria and you know this is a lot of money this can really this could be that money could basically end malaria and you know if you can, if you can provide seven hundred seventy-seven million for entities, why not for malaria? And this is, you know, mm -hmm. something that I think humans need to realize. Like some of the big world leaders, you know, this is something that a question that came to my ha my mind a few days ago is, if I had a trillion dollars or more than a trillion dollars, and that money can solve world hunger, and I'll still remain with a lot, mm -hmm. would I really want to? Because I'd want to get nice houses nice cars you know nice things you know because the the thing like elon musk for example he can solve world hunger in like in the, in the with a snap of a finger and um he would still remain with a lot of money but because humans really when money was created you know humans before it never used to value it as much but these days we value it so much because money answers all things says in the bible and you know as a human you always contemplate i could just stop this world hunger or i could just stop this health issues but because I really want, you know, this money and I want to get nice things, you know, materialistic things, basically, um, there's, there's a kind of a barrier that that causes. And that barrier is one of the huge, one of the biggest barriers in the world. Because right now, all the companies and all the world leaders, you know, they could just pay so much money just to end like Malaya, for example. And um, everything would be solved and there wouldn't have to be any, like, more and more money put into it. But because humans just... I'm not saying about it, but because humans have interests of mind and, you know, we want to do what we want and we feel like we have the power to do whatever we want, you know. We don't mm -hmm. think about the future. Or the, you know, we always think about today. And I've always, I, I used to think about today. And, I, you know, as a human, I still do. And as a 13-year-old, I still always think about today instead of tomorrow. So I think it's just that 
Well, the biggest change that yes, humans can do to stop all you know, these world issues and world hungers and stuff like that is mm. realize that money isn't everything in the world. But as much as I love money, because money answers all things. <laughs> I do too, but... <laughs> Yeah, like, do you not have nice clothes, nice things, be able to afford your accommodation, like go to nice hotels, it's really nice, you know, because people created it. And um, I think we have to realize that if it's not happening next to you, it doesn't mean it's not happening to other people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's it. I've talked a bit I too think, much. I think yeah. that, no, I think that's a powerful message. And you are not off the mark because mm-hmm. um, all the events that I've been moderating at COP28 and even before, uh, people are begging for more financing. People are begging for more money. We're not going to at- achieve a uh, climate change uh, response. We're not going to solve health issues. We're not going to solve education issues if we don't have money. And I think that is such a powerful, powerful message uh, from you. So you inspire so many people. You sit in rooms with so many powerful mm-hmm. people. If young people are watching you in the world today, hearing mm-hmm. your your story and your journey, and they want to get started with something, some contribution to the world. What would you say to them? What motivation would you give them? Motivation I would give them, number one, stay close to your God. If it gives you faith, if it gives you power, stay close to God. Number two is don't do it if you're forced to. If, you're, if your grandpa, if your grandma, if your mom told you, I want you to do this for me, or I want you to do tree planting or stuff like that. Sorry, that was a bit of a robotic voice. Or if like your, your parents That's say, wonderful. I want you to do this. I want to be a doctor and you don't want to be a doctor. Maybe you want to be a nurse. Or you want to be a neurosurgeon. Do whatever you want. And um, do it with authenticity. Do it with your authentic self. Mm. Do it because you want to make a difference in the world. Do it, you know, with your heart, soul and mind. Do it because there's actually a difference that you might put into the world. And, you know, whatever small difference it may be. And do it because... You want to create a better life for people. You want to help people's life. You want to help people's lives become better. And I think number, that was number two, number three. Number three, have fun when you're doing it. I mean, I have as much as, much as fun. Number four, don't let people take advantage of you. Mm. And um, I think I said already have fun. But I think number two is, you know, make sure you just relax and, um, and do what you're doing because it's a cause. And have faith in yourself and have faith in your God, number one. But have faith in yourself. And, you know, Avoid negative thoughts like, for example, wanting to quit. I mean, that's a thought I, I took out of my mind immediately because I'm like, I can't quit right now because God ordained this for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think those are the main ones I'd say. And for world leaders, please listen to us kids. Give us more opportunity to speak because, you know, if you if you listen to this interview and you're hearing me as a 13-year-old girl, you know, doing all this work, I mean, you should give more opportunities to kids like, like, kids like me or kids like us. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much. I think that's absolutely amazing. And I'm so grateful that you gave us your time. But I'm also grateful to see you having fun because you've contributed a lot to COP28. I'm glad you're taking time out to relax and have fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. She truly, truly is an inspiration. Only 13 years old and reminds us that you can make a difference wherever you are. So somebody who can no longer be regarded as youth but knows a lot about the power of protest to shift conversation and create meaningful change, is human rights and climate justice activist Kumi Naidu. He has really lived a life of protest, starting with his activism against apartheid at age 15. He was International Executive Director of Greenpeace International and Secretary General of Amnesty International. Naidu served as the Secretary General of Civicus, the International Alliance for Citizen Participation. His most dramatic protest was defying a court injunction and boarding an oil rig to protest the drilling of oil in the Arctic. That was back in 2011. He hasn't stopped protesting. He joins us now to share his perspective on the role of protest action in influencing outcomes at climate conferences, but also to share his thoughts about the importance of this climate conference. So Kumi Naidu, you've had quite a dramatic life. I really want to get the elephant out of the room because when I told some of my colleagues that you climbed an oil rig and there were some inflated balloons, you were in the middle of the ocean or something and then you got arrested, we just couldn't picture how it all happened. That was a dramatic protest. Remind us again why you did it and would you do it again this time around about 12 years later? So... This was in 2011 uh, in the Greenlandic Arctic and then 2012 in the Russian Arctic. 
at that time, people didn't recognize that the Arctic is sort of like a refrigerator or air conditioner of the planet. So basically, in the summer months, when the ice levels go very low in the Arctic, it means that the planet is warming up crazily. And therefore, we have so many extreme weather events uh, during that time. So it was about trying to break the silence because countries like Russia, uh, even Greenland, were looking at, oh, the ice is not there, let's go and drill. Mm -hmm. And whereas that should have been a warning sign that we're running out of time. So it was really about uh, drawing the world's attention. And today, I think there's sufficient attention on the fact that uh, we must uh, see what's happening in Antarctica with the melting ice uh, bergs as well as in Arctic. This is all contributing to sea level rise. And I think the message has got out there. Um, I, I would be okay about going back again. 12 years sure. later, are you as fit yeah. as you were? Uh, no, certainly not. But I should tell you one uh, uh, funny thing. My brother, while I was in prison in Greenland, uh, after that action was on uh, interview and they asked him, so what really is, was Kumi protesting about? And he said, uh, I don't really understand, but you know what? <laughs> it must be really important because he can't swim to save his backside. So it must be really important if you took that risk. But I just want to say something else, which is really important. Mm. The placard that I was carrying then said, stop Arctic destruction. This was in 2011 where people didn't really understand what that slogan meant. And while I was on the inflatable, looking at the high waves and all of that, I thought if this was the last protest that I would be engaged in, if I kicked it, you know, there <laughs> to make it out, that 99% of my friends, family, and colleagues back in Africa wouldn't understand what that slogan was. Mm. And one of the weaknesses of climate activism is that we have not been communicated in as accessible ways as we need to. And one of the kids in my family, when I got out of prison and got back home to Durban, said to me, you know, Uncle Kumi, that was such a silly slogan. As Nobody understood children would. It. And then I said, what would have been a better slogan? And she said, save Santa Claus now. Huh. Think, about the brilliance. Think, think about the brilliance of what she was saying. She was saying, you folks who are activists, you all are projecting your consciousness on mm -hmm. us. The only association that ordinary people have with what's happening there in the Arctic is that Santa Claus fictionally lives there. And so part of the moment that we're in right now is really about not trying to move the climate struggle forward with facts, figures, science, theories, and mm. policy proposals only, because we aim everything at the head, yeah. and we need to start moving, aiming things at the heart, where people actually are moved in a much more wholesome mm. way, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's very cold there, eh? even in the summer <laughs> I'm months. Sure, I'm so sure. It's not something I'm looking forward to doing. I think I remember your facial expression. There was I was scared. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, yeah. everybody could see I was, I was super scared. Petrified. <laughs> but you did. But I mean, that whole idea around the heart, I think it is absolutely, absolutely important because sometimes the danger with activism. Uh, is to be niche and speak amongst yourselves and speak exactly. amongst li like-minded people. Whereas exactly. climate justice is really for the vulnerable. They Absolutely. know what their lives are like, but you want to connect across geographies, across class, across race, right? Absolutely right. And, and thankfully, we're seeing a shift. So, for example, a lot of my work right now, including through the Ricky Rick Foundation for the Promotion of Artivism, is saying if you want to move people, we need to bring arts, culture, and activism together, right? And that's what we call energizing activism. And if you look at the people that are promoting fascist ideas in the world today, uh, in the United States and Europe and elsewhere, they are ignoring facts, obviously. If you take like Donald Trump, is mm. full of lies. But not only they're ignoring facts, they don't aim anything at the head. They mm. go straight for the heart weaponize hate, weaponize this identity and Islamophobia and, uh, you know, um, all these things that are aimed at getting people really riled up. Getting them and, emotive yeah. and all of that. It's so quite, mm. I am certainly not saying we need to deviate from the truth and the facts. We must stick to it and the science because it's all on our side. 
but we have to learn to speak in ways that move people and get people to feel mm-hmm. that listen our because it's important that we understand that the climate struggle is not about saving the planet the planet actually does not need saving if we continue on the path that we are mm-hmm. warming up the planet like we are doing the end result is our soil gets destroyed our water resources get destroyed it gets so hot we cannot grow food mm-hmm. the end result is we will be gone the planet will still be here yeah. and everybody is worried about saving the planet they may say don't worry about it because if we become dis- extinct as a species the forests will recover the ocean will mm. replenish and so on we need to understand that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more and nothing less than protecting our children and their children's futures and that's why whatever difficult and complex changes we need to make we must be master the political will to do that you know it's it's so profound what you are saying because if as human beings we are inherently selfish and cynics say we are inherently selfish let's grant them that that act do the right thing even if it's just for self preservation so even from a self preservation point of view climate justice is absolutely important but i want to talk about activism activism itself and the space of protest in shifting the needle i've been at cop28 and um you know i try not to get cynical about uh, these these negotiations because they are absolutely important i saw more young people than one would would typically see they were involved in plenaries discussions and so on there was criticism that the protests were staged i mean it's the uae it wasn't as spontaneous and as robust as you would see elsewhere but you try and focus on the granular details and you see how protest has influenced some policy shifts and i wonder your perspective do you beyond the optics of protesting and activism do you think that activism and protest has influenced policy shifts at these um climate negotiations over the years the short answer is yes but it's important to recognize that a lot of the deals are made in meetings that happen before the cop itself cop yes. is the finalization of the range of meetings that happen during the course of the year and 95% of the deals if you want are done beforehand right so what then is the value of the cop i've recently said that the cop is a extremely imperfect negotiating forum because you don't have the right composition that is there however what it offers young people indigenous people people from frontline communities people from the global south and so on whose voices are not generally heard it offers them a communicative opportunity to actually communicate the urgency of the situation the changes that we want to make and so on so if you take the question of loss and damage mm. most people were saying for more than a decade you get you know you folks will never get progress on loss and damage because rich countries will not want to agree to that because then that is a statement that in fact they carry the biggest responsibility and they don't want it to be so clear but in egypt we got the cop mm. uh, we got the cop to agree to the loss and damage fund and yes in this cop 28 we have got symbolic contributions of money towards the fund but the important thing is the principle was achieved like i mean if you look the united states has put 27 million into the fund i i think i might be getting that wrong i think the united states put 17 million into the fund but just to put that in context the us spends 2 billion dollars on military expenditure every single day the if you look at the political will it's it's quite not there so the other big problem with the cop is and this one has just been extreme mm-hmm. is the domination of the cop by the fossil fuel industry yes right mm-hmm. so you had this time around close to 5000 lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry yes. right you got the chair of the cop who was the ceo of one of the most dirty oil companies in the world and questioned the science of the impact of uh, exactly. fossil fuels actually yeah and then you look at and just to give you a sense This is four times as many fossil fuel lobbyists was in the Paris climate negotiations in 
right? So it's not getting less, it's getting more. And the way I've put it, if you want to see the absurdity of that, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous, who do amazing work to help people with alcoholic alcohol addiction, is like Alcoholics Anonymous having a global conference, and the largest delegation to the conference is the alcohol industry, you know? <laughs> Uh, and or, or if you take this particular cop, it's as if the CEO of one of the largest alcohol industry, uh, the alcohol companies, chairing the the conference. Mm. So we have to break the addiction to fossil fuels. And I think the important thing is we're now getting language on the phase out of fossil fuels. Yes. Uh, which, by the way, do you know the first time? fossil fuels was mentioned in the climate declaration mm. was just in 2021 in the Glasgow COP. Mm. And these negotiations have been going on for decades, mm. right? So they, they had the power not to have the attention aimed at one of the core uh, reasons for it. I mean, the chair of the COP has backslided then mm. after those things. He said, yes. no, I support the science and so on. Because literally, other than Donald Trump, almost uh, when he was head of state, virtually every head of state, including every CEO of fossil fuel companies, had reached a point where they knew that the activism and the education that came from it uh, had won the debate that uh, you cannot anymore say that fossil yes. fuels, but, but also just for historical, uh, you know, for, for just to get the history right, the people that knew about the harmful effects of the burning of oil, coal, and gas, what we call fossil fuels, the mm. people who knew first were the scientists of the fossil fuel companies. So if you go back and you look, those that were drilling offshore were picking up the levels of the uh, oil rigs because they knew that sea level rise was happening, right? So there's enough things to... Uh, but that's what they were doing in the practice. But on the other hand, they were saying, oh... It's not such a big problem. Yeah. We'll sort it out and so on. And people need to make a connection between the fossil fuel industry and the slave industry. Yeah. Right? That the bad. Fossil, fossil fuel industry, when the dominant nations of the world that relied, the economies relied on the slave trade, it was when fossil fuels was discovered and was deployed that they said, ah, oh, okay, we, we can do away with slavery now because we can get a lot of work done by the fossil fuels that, you know, people are doing through actual physical labor. Yeah. But I draw this connection to say, just as today, when we look back at the slave-owning class of that time, we look at them with disdain, mm -hmm. with horror, with uh, a sense of how could you have done that. History is beginning now to look back at the fossil fuel industry already as how could you do that, you know? Mm. And just because slavery was right and legal, sorry, just because slavery was legal, it didn't make it right. It right exactly. Just because fossil fuels are legal today, it doesn't make it right when it's killing our children and their children's futures. Yeah. I just want to conclude this conversation around the presence of the fossil fuel industry. That is one of the criticisms that I've been hearing, that they've been uh, given much greater space than before to influence and so on. I'm just reflecting on that. And I mean, it's not just playing devil's advocate. I'm just thinking that we can't wish these, this, these industries away. We can't wish them away. They're there. What is the best way to engage them? Not to beg them to do the right thing. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. But does it is it also not indicative of something else that perhaps their presence is indicative of the fossil fuel industry realizing that their own fortunes and survival is linked to the future of our planet and our humanity, that they can no longer be outside of these conversations. And if they're going to survive somehow, they need to listen to what the scientists are saying, to what indigenous communities are saying, and so on. So having them in with a very ubiquitous presence may just indicate a realization by themselves that, you know what, the horse has bolted. We, we've got to be part of the solution or uh, face our demise. Well, I think it depends then who you send, who from the fossil fuel industry goes. What we have mostly is lobbyists, right? People who are there 
who are going into negotiations, who are going after country delegates and so on. And sometimes even I've seen it in action in previous COPs where they are making promises, even funding promises and so on, right? We don't need 4,500 people from the fossil fuel industry to be at any COP like we had in COP28. Okay. A representation, for sure, mm -hmm. uh, but not such that it's bigger than any country's delegation. Mm -hmm. If you take all the least developed countries, they are about five times the amount of the small island states' delegations to the COP and so on. And this needs, the COP needs to be a place where our governments lead. They mm -hmm. need to listen to civil society. They need to listen to business and so on. But the important thing is the fossil fuel industry doesn't need to be there. They are so massively powerful and rich mm -hmm. that they have their own scientists and they are ahead of the curve, right? They have knowledge about almost everything because good planning requires them to do that. So do we need dialogue with them? Yes. But let's be clear. Now they all agree, with a few exceptions, periodically, that they have to phase out fossil fuels. So you would think, okay, that's good. We're in agreement that ultimately fossil fuels has to go. But where's the big difference? The difference is they want to stretch it out for as long as possible into this century, right? And, you know, uh, and we have been saying 2050 might be too late, right? We need to bring that deadline uh, forward. Now, none of us who have been campaigning over these years are naive enough to think we can just switch it off tomorrow. We need a just transition. There are workers that work in those industry. They, they need to be transitioned into clean energy jobs. And, and let's, you know, there's one thing that is never said sufficiently enough. Assuming climate change was not a problem, assuming the burning of oil, coal, and gas didn't constitute the problem of the potential destruction of the planet. Should we still do fossil fuels? Because we live on a planet that's finite. At some point, you're going to run out of it because we live on a finite planet with finite resources. So why we would not invest in clean, renewable methods of energy generation is the question that must be asked. And here's my conclusion after many decades of activism around this issue now. And this sounds sad for me to say it, but South Africa, my own country, teaches me this. That the supply chain of corruption in big fossil fuel projects is much richer, much juicier, much more lucrative than in renewable energy projects that tend to be smaller in scale, more decentralized, and so on. I mean, with our country, I'm not saying that the exceptional skill in corruption that we have in our political leadership at the moment, that they can't make renewable energy projects also corrupt. I'm not saying that. But the options and the scale of it is much, much less. Mm -hmm. And so um, the writing has been on the wall. Our political leaders through the international panel on climate change, the IPCC, the scientists, have been explicit about this. There's no contestation about the science other than from people who are denialists of, 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 and are out of touch with reality. So the time really has come for us to recognize that we are on a suicidal trajectory, that we are playing political poker with the future of our children every month, every year that we delay taking action. And that we cannot change the science. All we can change is political will. And thankfully, as elections are coming in 2024 in South Africa and many other countries, we should remind ourselves that political will is a renewable commodity because we can kick them out if we can organize well enough to do that. That is a sobering point on which to leave this first part of our conversation. Thank you very much, Kumi Naidu. So we hope you enjoyed this special edition podcast series from Invest Tech. If you don't want to miss the final episode of COP28 All Access with me, Ridi Tabi, be sure to follow Invest Tech Focus Radio SA on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening and we'll be back soon.
The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Bank Limited, an authorized financial services provider and registered credit provider.